You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We are in the Lutheran Witness. It is August, barely. We're, we're squeezing it in. It's the last day of <laughs> August. We're squeezing this in so that we can take a look at some of the great topics in this month's issue. Sarah, you really liked this one and really wanted to there's, dig into this topic. There's just so many jokes heresies. about heresy. There's so many heresies. We're going we're gonna to talk about heresy today. <laughs> I love it. I don't, uh, this probably sounds terrible, but it's really interesting. <laughs> expert on heresy today. <laughs> The, the Reverend Roy Askins, managing editor of the Lutheran Witness. Hey, how's it going? Thanks you, for joining us. You're not a heretic, though. Let's just no, no, that, that's fine. Clear the I, air on that one. I wanted, well, I wanted to I, let like, him define I was, it first. I, well, <laughs> we'll get there. I wanted to ask the, some of our writer, writers. I actually, in fact, no. I, I should say I actually sent an email to somebody in this building to write an, an article for us, and I said, "Pick your favorite heresy and write on it." <laughs> <laughs> He refused. So, anyways, it is what it is. But. Sarah says he's not a heretic, but I don't know. Are you? What do you <laughs> think? What's a best? heretic? Let's. What's a heretic? Okay, so Let's what is that. heresy? What, what Let's is start heresy? with that word. We'll start with that one. So, we were talking briefly about how we like to throw this word around for basically anything we don't like or anything we don't agree with, but it has a technical definition. As, and it comes from a Greek word which actually means to choose for one's self. I want to say that again. Mm. The word heretic means to choose for one's self, right? And this this is in contradiction to or in, in distinction from that which is handed down by the church to you, right? So you have, for instance, St. Paul and Timothy, the letter to his letter to Timothy telling him to hold on to the good deposit that was entrusted to you, right? This is the doctrine, the teaching of the church as drawn from the scripture handed down from the church to its its path through its pastors to its people this is this is the orthodox teaching right well when one chooses for oneself one becomes a heretic when one says this is actually what i want to believe in teach and confess instead and why in many ways we did this issue because if we think a lot about our christian faith and, and the way many christians think about what they believe they think in terms of choosing for oneself right so for instance if i can ask put you on the spot here either of you how why do you belong to the church to which you belong now? Because I believe in what it teaches. Okay, I like that. That's good. Andy, do you want to take a crack at it? Because that's where God put me. Ah! <laughs> See, that, that's a great answer. That's the, so, so often, though, we think about church shopping in terms of what? Choose, what I like. It, it, yeah, Cafeteria like. Christianity. Yeah, exactly. What appeals to me, mm-hmm. what, what, what makes me happy, right? What do I... That is literally the definition of heresy, right? So the point is here, let's look at what does the scripture say? You know, how has God passed this down, on to, down to us? Now, once again, I'm not saying every Christian is a heretic. What I am saying is we need to think a little bit about what does it mean to have this faith, this good deposit that was entrusted in the scriptures through the apostles to the church, and what it means to hold to and confess that before the world so yeah heretic heresy yeah a lot of heresy in this episode i'm in this just this episode let let me ask you let me ask you before we hop in what was what was your favorite heresy we discussed (laughs) my personal favorite heresy (laughs) gotta be careful what i say no moralistic therapeutic deism i think is the Mm. most fascinating one because it shows up in far more places than we realize and after i read this article and it's Joel Bierman wrote this one. Yes, he yes. Did. which I mean, he's brilliant anyway. But after I read the article and listened to him talk about it, and then I w- started watching some movies, yes. I couldn't watch them anymore because the entire message is moralistic therapeutic deism. And I was just yelling at the screen because yes. I was like, this is this is heretical. I can't <laughs> I can't enjoy it. Well, and, and in so many ways, even once again, for many Christians, this is the baseline view that people don't realize. This is their fundamental worldview. Yes. That this is how they look at the world, and and we got I got a lot of great comments from people who read this article on moralistic therapeutic deism. He was really well received on on the issues interview as well, mm-hmm. and he does such a great job of just kind of distilling this down. It's nothing new. I think the study that he kind of really identified moralistic therapeutic deism came from the early two thousands, the early aughts, but it really kind of picked up steam around twenty ten, and people started talking about it. But 
All right, yeah. so what is it? So what is it? Yeah. Well, you have three big terms there, moralistic, therapeutic deism. So moralistic, focused, it has a, an emphasis on legalism, on morals, living a good life, right? A therapeutic, focused predominantly on the idea that religion is something that's supposed to make me feel good and happy and well-adjusted, right? It has a therapeutic sense to it. And then the term deism... Is, is, is actually from, was originally coined in the Enlightenment era to, to reflect how they talk about God. Modern deism is slightly different in this sense, but it is the idea that God is a, like a, a watchmaker. He, he created the world, he wound it up, and then he walked away, and he doesn't really interact with it so much anymore. Deism today, or the deism described here in this pot article, doesn't say that. It does say he occasionally intervenes, but he's only there when I need him. I, I refer to it as like treating God like a cosmic candy machine, right? I can put in my prayers, and as long as I put in enough prayers, then he'll give me my candy bar that I was looking for, right? But in the meantime, he's just kind of there ready for me when I need him, but he doesn't really interact and bother with my daily life, right? And practically, we kind of joke about this now, but practically the way we live, we live this way so many times, right? Mm. Like we think about what, what is my faith. Well, it's something I do on Sunday morning, right? It's not necessarily directing my life and and actions in my daily life in the world. So let me give a little bit more here. He gives a little bit more detail here on these by drawing out five points in terms of the way people think about the world that illustrate a moralistic therapeutic deism. He says, there is a God who created the world and oversees human life on earth. That's kind of the deistic side mm-hmm. of things. People, it's really fascinating. One of the studies we've done, written on a couple of times over the last two years or so has been on the rise of the nuns, right? Those Mm -hmm. who say they don't believe in any religious system. They're still very religious. They're spiritual, not religious, spiritual. They do believe there's some sort of eternal being, some sort of spiritual essence out there. They just don't like the Christian system, the Christian religious system. I'm using air quotes if you can't see that here, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to be end up in my own pages of my own magazine here. Right? Uh, they, they believe that there is some sort of being out there. They just don't like the, religi- the Christian system. So they are very religious. They believe in God. Number two, in line with the Bible and most religions, God desires people to be good, nice, and fair to one another. Right? This is the moralistic side of things. They do believe that there is some sort of responsibility ethic that you have to be kind to one another. Right? The, Lewis nails this. C.S. Lewis nails this really well in uh, mere Christianity, kind of the opening to mere Christianity, where he talks about, you know, all these people that say there's no such thing as a moral ethic. You smack them on the nose and suddenly there's a moral ethic because you hit them and you did something that violated their space, right? Mm -hmm. You steal from them. Suddenly there's some sort of moral code out there to which you belong because you can't steal from me. Well, why not, right? So they, they believe that God genuinely just wants people to be nice, kind to one another. Three, the overall goal of life is to be happy and feel good about oneself. That's the therapeutic side of things. Mm-hmm. This is very prevalent. Mm-hmm. You see this in a lot in these these health crazes that come around. You, these these uh, things like Soul Cycle have very religious overtones in the way they 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 do their programs. Right? I mean, it's terrifying yeah, it's when you get everywhere. into it. Oh, it's it's awful. And then four, God is involved in one's life only to the degree to which problems need to be fixed, right? Once again, God is the cosmic candy machine. And then five, when they die, good people go to heaven, which is just actually rank heresy. We could jump into, you know, Pelagianism now if you wanted to. That would be the the direction that one would go. But <laughs> Well, it depends on how we define good. Sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, what, the Athanasian Creed uses that term, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in the in the sense that the, what this is basically argu- advocating for is I'm going to go to heaven because I had made good choices. Mm-hmm. I lived a good life rather than recognizing I am a sinner and I am only good in Christ Jesus baptized into him. I am made good by virtue of what he's done on my behalf. But that's not the, the sense in which this is being used in, in MTD. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, that was a fun heresy. Yeah. And you're right. We we see it all over in culture. I mean, Sarah pointed out it's in movies. All over the place. I mean, it's it's even infiltrated curriculum Mm -hmm. in schools and... Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. So, okay, well, so that was I'm, I'm interested, if I can, can I ask another question? I want to ask you a question here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, here we go. What, what's, a, what's an example you saw in a movie that just really kind of, you were like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. Okay, so I don't know if I want to, like, blatantly name the movie. Am I allowed to do that? <laughs> okay, so we watched the Trolls movie. Okay. And the plane, and the whole premise of the movie was that they were finding happiness. And if they were not made happy, then life wasn't worth living. And eating trolls makes you happy. And eating trolls makes you happy. 
it was oh, my goodness. my brain was exploding because it was just so yes. in your face of like the highest goal of life is happiness. Yeah. I mean, well, so even think, I know you're going to wrap up this heresy, but there's so much more you can do with this here. <laughs> Just think about how we talk to our children about their careers and future life, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. How much of this is directed around find a career that you can you can be successful in, that you can make a lot of money, and then you can retire at 65, right? Or 55 or whatever it is. As though the entire purpose of this is that you feel self-fulfilled. Mm-hmm. The, the raw truth is God isn't necessarily about you feeling self-fulfilled about yourself, right? Mm-hmm. It's actually that you would know him and that you would deny yourself and instead live in him him and in the life he gives this is probably the philosophy or the the way of thinking the world view where the idea of follow your heart comes from oh, oh yeah. and yes. mysticism too or well gnosticism or as i like to call it gnosticism, gnosticism. we're gonna get to that one should we should we do that in just a minute i know sure. we've got we've a bunch done. more to get to we'll do that in just a moment <laughs> we're talking about heresies ancient and modern from the august issue of the lutheran witness with the reverend roy askins we'll be right back in just a moment you're listening to the coffee hour i'm andy bates i'm sarah golseth At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking heresy today. Yeah. Uh, Whatever variety of heresy you'd like, we we might cover it today. (laughs) We're taking a look at the August issue of The Lutheran Witness with Reverend Roy Askins. He's managing editor of The Lutheran Witness. Okay, so we've covered one and we've got like 10 more to cover, but I don't know if we'll get to all of them. How many did you actually cover in this issue? I lost count. I think we got 11. 11. Nah, wasn't there? Was there that many? There wasn't that many. That's a different issue. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. We got six. 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 Hmm. So... What another favorite one from this that you want to get to? I mean, I like Gnosticism, but there are Let's plenty do of others. Okay. Let's do Gnosticism. Another yeah. But it's yeah, spelled Gnosticism. Game. Yes. <laughs> Gnosticism. It's from the Greek word gnosis. Yeah, yeah. You, you had that primed ready to go. And it means knowledge and uh, referring to these. It's actually an ancient cult, ancient religious system that as, and as Peter Burf- Burfiend talked about in his articles, very parasitic, right? It would mm-hmm. just kind of absorb other religious systems. And it was ca- kind of on the rise as Christianity was also increasing. And and so it started incorporating elements of Christianity, but it's also very bizarre. Now, what ends up happening in Christianity is it kind of ejects some of the bizarre things, like there's theories about the the Pleroma, which is this plane of undifferentiated all, allness and goodness, and I'm not entirely sure what that means, but, you know, and they had aeons, which were these various bits of the deity, and you know, there was a good deity and a bad deity. And in fact, you need, if you're going to read this issue, I should mention, uh, if you read this article, you also need to pick up next the next issue afterwards. We we wrote a little bit of a correction to, to a mistake we made in the editing process in this article. So pick up, this would have been September? Yes. The next one is September. Yeah, next next yes. one September. That I, usually comes after August. <laughs> I don't know what month I'm in. <laughs> I'm already working on the January issue. My brain is just all <laughs> over the place here. So, so Gnosticism, so it, it has this kind of weird mythological system with it. And Christianity, some some Christian heretics ejected that stuff, but then kept what was the core teaching of Gnosticism, which is that that which is truly good and truly important is the spiritual and that this thing that I have on my body, in my body, this material world in which we live, it's all trash, it's garbage. And, and what's really important is the spiritual thing. And what this led to in the Gnostic heretics was one of two responses, either a severe asceticism, 
which says, in order to purify myself spiritually, I must deny any sort of desire that I have, completely deny any sort of physical responses that I have, you know, not eat fast for days and days and live in, in cells and, and completely and totally subjugate my body in order to purify my spiritual essence. So that was one response. The other response of Gnosticism was a pure hedonism, which says, if this material world is all useless and trash, why would I bother with, I can't hurt it, right? The point is my spiritual essence. And so they would go live wild and profligate lives because it was the spiritual that was important, not the physical body. Now, of course, Christianity does not say that. Um, Our Mm -hmm. Lord and Savior becomes man. He is, of course, God, and he joins himself to human flesh that he might suffer and die to redeem this human flesh. And his promise is that when we are resurrected on the last day, we will not be resurrected without a body. We will, in fact, be resurrected with the very body that we are given that will die here on earth, but will be resurrected to live with him forever, and that we will live this embodied existence, right? It's amazing to me that when God creates the world, he speaks so much of it into existence, but with man, he actually bends down and gets his hands dirty. He plays in the mud, right, and makes makes man playing in the mud. He makes man breathe. I mean, imagine just the 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 idea here that God makes man and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living being. I just marvel at that. But you see there both the idea that man is a spiritual being, right, but then also a physical being united in one whole, and that death is the unnatural rending of these things, right? It is not to be that way. We are actually to be conceived of of as one or one whole, both body and soul. Gnosticism is another one that shows up everywhere. If you yes. if you know what you're looking for, it's all over the place, and it's mm-hmm. so easy to miss it. I think in a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big places might be all of our social media use <laughs> and the metaverse and what that like that all ties into. Gnosticism. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just just think, right? So this idea of transhumanism, right? Yeah. Are you familiar with the transhumanist movement where basically you're transcending beyond humanity and what are you doing? You are uploading your consciousness mm-hmm. into a computer while you were, where you will live as a as a, a series of, I guess, ones and zeros. The, 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 the reality is even in this idea of transhumanism, we still can't fully transcend the material world, right? Mm-hmm. Even if you find some way to upload your consciousness into a computer, you're still dependent on the machine there to make you make you work if it right. ever happens, right? Which I, I don't think it will. But the point being, yes, it's everywhere, this idea. You, you also see it in the idea, which is tied to, I think, also moralistic therapeutic deism, the idea of I'm spiritual but not religious, mm. right? Mm-hmm. As though the trappings of the church, the physical trappings of the church are, are a problem and I just have this kind of spiritual connection to the divine. Or, or also kind of in the idea that I don't need the church to mitigate my access to God, but rather I experience God directly and without, without the church's proclamation and without the church, the way the church delivers this through word and sacrament. Mm-hmm. Prosperity gospel. Oh, yeah, do that prosperity one. Gospel. I mean, all of these are kind of related. Yeah. All of, I mean, they're all false. <laughs> the, they're all false, but there, there's also a very a common thread, I think, oh, yeah. in all of them mm-hmm. as well. Prosperity gospel. Yeah, prosperity gospel. Preach. Yeah. So, <laughs> prosperity gospel is also just very prominent in the in the US particularly. And the mm-hmm. the fundamental idea of the prosperity gospel is actually built on I didn't know kind of the history here. This was Pastor Chris Rosebro wrote this article and he does a great job of of articulating the history here of this where this comes out of actually the new thought mind cult religions of the of 18th century, 19th century America. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly Christian Science and Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Eddy Baker. Is that right? Something like that. Mary Baker Eddy. Yeah. You I, had it right the first time. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> I got all the words in there, just not in the right order. It's so, so interesting that that's where it comes from, though. Yeah, yeah. And it's based on this idea, this this kind of a word of faith teaching, where if you believe it, you can bring this into existence. Which, once again, I think this is what you're saying with Gnosticism. The, the Secret, which is a book Oprah promoted back in the early 2000s, yeah. is part of this as well, but it's very much a part of Gnosticism, right? The Secret is the idea that there's a special knowledge. You just speak this into—you you speak positive thoughts into the universe, and they're going to happen. Happen, right? 
this is the Christian version of this, that if you're just positive and you think happy thoughts and you and you send the money in to the preacher that he wants, suddenly God's going to bless you and give you all sorts of prosperity that you yourself, for you yourself, right? And you see this in the preaching of, I mean, the most egregious example, of course, is, is Joel Osteen, but you see this in other places as well, where God wants you to be happy, he wants you to be wealthy, and all you have to do is this, that, and the other thing. And the focus here is not on our eternal life and relationship with God, but in fact on our living our existence here and now, and that we live happy and fulfilled lives. Once again, the, back to moralistic mm, therapeutic yeah, deism, there right? <laughs> <laughs> the point of our faith is not that we live happy, well-adjusted lives, mm-hmm. right? The point is actually that we learn to deny ourselves and live in Christ and in his love. So... There's, is there anything specific about prosperity gospel you want to ask rather than just listen, listening to me rant about it? So. <laughs> well, there, there's a very dark side to this one that mm. when it doesn't work, mm-hmm. what yeah. that can do to people. Yeah. Pastor Rosebro pointed this out, that the loss of faith that people experience so often with this this false religion, this heresy. He had some, I don't remember exactly what the examples were, but there are some pretty terrifying examples of people who lose faith, you know, suicide. I mean, just the terrible things that happen when you're being told time and time again, if you just believe, if you just have enough faith, if you just think happy thoughts and you're thinking happy thoughts all the time and life is just suffering, right? And nothing works out the way you'd hoped it worked out. It's a, very easy to lose to lose faith and to and to watch as you watch things fall apart. That becomes very painful, especially as we think about our Lord's admonition when he he doesn't say if you follow me. He said he doesn't say if you follow me, all's going to go well. You're going to get a fancy car and a big house. In fact, he <laughs> says something else quite different. He says if a man would follow me, let him take up his cross. Right. The, the the life of the Christian is actually one of suffering, actually one of self sacrifice, and uh, and our world's really struggles to hear that. But the the reality is, I think this is in the long term more helpful because our rea- life is suffering. There are difficult struggles we have in this life, and when we see that this is what Christ came to resolve, and that it will be ultimately resolved in Him on the last day, this is a great comfort to, to us, and that Christ does this for us on the cross and continues to renew and sustain us in the church. It's so insidious how this one kind of slips in. And maybe it's because we're Lutherans in America and this is kind of a uniquely American mm-hmm. heresy. But it's when you start thinking about it, it it slips into our thinking mm-hmm. and how, how we function as Christians and maybe some of the things that we say to each other without really understanding where it comes from. Yeah. Well, do you have an example of that? Well, the like sometimes we think we don't pray hard enough for yes. like... And and that's I mean obviously I know that's not true but every once in a while that little thought is like oh maybe maybe I should pray about this again and that will get make God or it wasn't do a it sincere me. enough prayer yeah yeah right yeah. like I prayed I prayed but I didn't really pay attention to it and had I been paying attention to it maybe he would have answered it a little bit better mm-hmm. right or or the idea that you know if as a we're a, we're a small church in a shrinking town in Kansas middle of nowhere Kansas which I love the middle of nowhere it's a great town in Kansas and our church is shrinking. And maybe it's because we don't have enough faith. Maybe we're mm-hmm. not trying hard enough. Maybe we're not, you know, and and maybe, but maybe it's just as the context where God puts you. And this is the, the, the struggle under which you have to bear right now in this time, right? And And even if that church has to close, it doesn't mean that God's church has stopped to function there in that place, right? Mm-hmm. That, that the, the gospel is not going forth. The whole point is that you can't measure God's attitude toward you based on your material things around you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. God is not. This is probably the more insidious part that I see where we think that I lose my job. I lose my income. I'm now living in poverty. God must be mad at me. Mm. Actually, it could be the exact opposite, that he's (laughs) training you up as a child and he is. We know it's the exact opposite. Obviously, he loves you. Right. (laughs) the, the, The point is, it's not that he's abandoned you in that moment, but that he is, in fact, training you and teaching you up in that moment as you bear up under suffering. So the the prosperity gospel teaches the exact opposite of mm-hmm. what our Lord says to us about our life in him. So we've covered MTD or moralistic therapeutic deism, mm-hmm. Gnosticism, and prosperity gospel. There are at least three more in yes. this in this issue of the the August issue of the Lutheran Witness, some of my favorites, and I know we only have a time, like what, a minute left here, but a, a few others that you cover. Arianism, mm-hmm. that's the 
briefly describe that? Denies the divinity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm, bad, Nis- news. Nis- bad news. Bad news. Nestorianism and Eutychism. Eutychianism. 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 Yes, yes, yes. So I always get these confused. One of them, they're both heresies regarding the two natures in Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of them combines the two natures, and one of them separates them. And I can never remember which is which. So pick up your issue of the, the magazine to read that. And Pelagianism, which... Uh, I think we probably see semi-Pelagianism in American evangelicalism more than anything else. And and in Rome, actually, semi-Pelagianism is is very prevalent in Rome. Pelagianism is the idea that you can earn your own salvation. Hmm. The opposite of Pelagianism, which is another heresy that we addressed in this issue, is double predestination, right? So the cure to Pelagianism is no, God in fact chooses you. You don't get to work, earn your own salvation. You don't get to choose God. He chooses you. The opposite error is that, well, if God chooses me, well, then he must, all for salvation, he must also choose others for eternal damnation. That's also a heresy. So he chooses you, that does not mean he chooses others for damnation. Hmm. So if you enjoy heresy, <laughs> check out, if, or if you want to read about heresy, <laughs> let me put it that too. way. <laughs> if you'd like to learn about heresy, check out the August issue of The Lutheran Witness. Always a joy to chat with you. Thanks so much for being our guest today, Thank Pastor you. Askins. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Oh, oh. Real quick, how to find the Lutheran, Wit- Lutheran Witness. You can subscribe at cph.org slash witness, or you can visit our website, witness.lcms.org. Very good. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.